Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. You're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for the needleworkers. Our guest this week, Tanya Berlin. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Gary. Oh, Tanya, we got so many things to talk about here. So many techniques. But first, and, and see, we're going to do this first because I know we'll get to the end and not have time. I got to learn about your dogs and agility training. Because, I mean, um, I've known people who did that, but it's usually like little herder dogs and thing, you know, the little, and you do it with old English sheep dogs. And I find that amazing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I absolutely love it. When I first got my dog, so I first got a Newfoundland and he's pretty easy going, laid back. And then I got an old English sheep dog and he was quite all over the place running around. And I thought I have to do something with this dog to keep his mind <laughs> in active. And somebody has suggested to try agility. I thought, oh, yeah, I think he'd enjoy that. So I took him down, and, oh, my God, it was it was addictive. I just got addicted straight away. <laughs> you so, did. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I did, and he loved it too. Okay. And so, yeah, that's the important thing. You've got to have a dog that wants to do it as well. And so we've gone through a whole learning process of about four years doing this and both of us improving as we go. And we've been into competition. So last year we were in regionals um, in Alberta, and we came second in our group. So oh. I'm pretty, yeah. Wow. I'm pretty pleased with that. Yeah. Yes. So, now, all that so training... old, I mean, old English sheepdogs just don't strike me as a dog that would be doing, you know, going through little tubes and over <laughs> ramps, but they're, they're that agile, obviously, yeah. and, and active. Then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the appearances is are they look so fluffy and cute, and I keep mine in long coats, so they really look fluffy and cute. But underneath that, they're skinny and bony, a bit like a greyhound, and oh. you can keep them fit. And yeah, and they're really agile. Yeah, and oh. then, so they were bred for herding sheep, so they had to be agile for that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and they're really physically quite good at it, and um, people are always amazed when they see them um, running. There's, there's you can probably one now. Hear, yes, <laughs> I, I am in the furthest part of the house, but you probably still hear them occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, the hair is deceptive then. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But they are cute and cuddly still. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you keep the hair long, then it's a lot of grooming work. Oh, my gosh. I spend about at least two hours on each dog a week, if not more. Oh so my. I spend a whole hour just sitting on the floor watching TV and brushing the dog out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, at least you're multitasking. So that's worth something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I get, I get to watch TV at that point. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that, Well, that just sounds like fun because I, I've even watched on TV those agility things. It's just amazing what those dogs can do. And, yeah. uh, and, and it's, it's fun to watch the owners because they're always – leaning and pulling and all the body motion just to go with the dog it's like they're connected to each other yeah it's great and in canada you can run any dog in agility well some countries it's like more specific to border collies and shelties but in oh. canada they kind of welcome all breeds which is really great yeah. I, mean, I mean mine would be still good but they wouldn't be competitive against a border collie which has a much higher ground speed mm -hmm. so but so they're in their own class high group so oh, so that, they're with bigger oh. dogs Oh, okay. Yeah. So, it, yeah. so the playing field is somewhat level then. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that makes it fair, right? And it makes it fun for everybody and for the dogs too. Right. So what, if you've yeah. got a dog, give it a go. <laughs> no, nope, don't have a dog. I just, I just, uh, I think those things are just fascinating in the way people can get uh, any animal, but particularly dogs in this case, to do those things and do it at such a high level. I just think it's a fun thing. And, and it's, you know, it's not standing there without moving with your tail pointed in the air. Uh, it's, you know, it, I mean, there's some real skill to it. And I think that's, Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I've learned a lot for the agility um, and how people might struggle with needlework. Now I understand more because I've struggled in agility. <laughs> and now, now I can relate to some of my students when they're going, oh, I don't quite get this. Because for me, needlework came quite easily, but agility doesn't come easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can relate to now. Yeah. <laughs> much, yeah. much better, let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, that's just a great thing. I just had to learn about that a little bit. That's uh, <laughs> that's just fantastic. Yeah. So, all right, we, we've got – now, I'm signed up for your uh, pendant gold work thing where, yeah. you're, where you're testing out a new online teaching program so i mean teach you teach all over the place you've taught all over the place really all over the world and then yeah. uh, uh now this online thing but you've done online teaching before yeah so when i uh, had my first website and i had the first website from the year 2000 to 2017 
And in about the last four years of having the website, I set up an independent forum. It's called PHBB. And I had that. It's like separate from the website, and I was teaching on that. But now that I have my new website, I've implemented the forum on the actual website, so it's integrated better. So it's easier for the actual students to log in and um, post in there. And this time, previously what I have set up the online classes where you get uh, PDF files with work in progress pictures. And as you stitch the piece, you would post your work in progress pictures and I comment on it. On this particular class, I've actually done some videos as well of me demonstrating how to do the um, sewing down the metal threads on the pendant, as well as the PDF file, as well as the instructions, as well as that you can post pictures of your pendant as you stitch it so I can comment, as well as you can ask questions on the forum. So it's pretty rounded um, online class. Hopefully that it will cover everything you need to know. <laughs> and, and unfair to bring it up because signing up is closed, but... Um, yeah, I'm excited about it. So basically this this way, it allows you to have students who learn in every single way, uh, visually by hearing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It, that's why I think it's going to be really good. It's good for this particular technique with a metal thread, because sometimes you can uh, not realize the mistakes you can make as you're stitching down the metal threads where I can cover those and you can watch the videos first to see. Mm -hmm. And I can explain, don't do this because this will happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> important things to know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because when you're stitching, you might not have thought of those things, right? right, right. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, yeah. So with the needle painting, it's a little trickier for me to do that because uh, there's a lot of work involved with needle painting. Um, so it's better for me to actually have really good instructions of PDF files and then people uh, do a little bit of stitching, post it, then I will draw on their diagram, their picture. If their stitches are not quite long enough, I can draw onto their picture, like you need to make your stitches this length instead of the length you have. Oh, so that okay. It's, yeah. That's how I found the needle painting works really well. And yeah. a lot of people who have taken the needle painting one said they've actually enjoyed it as much or if not more than in the class time because you get actually more valuable time with me in the online class because I can evaluate every single stage. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a, in a actual in-person class where there's 24 people in the class, you may not get as much time in two days. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Only so many, so many minutes for so many people. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you, do you find that you enjoy online teaching more less than on site or it's just different and it doesn't matter? Just different and doesn't matter because okay. on site I like, talking to people because really this is the only social activity i get other than my agility <laughs> other than your dogs <laughs> so, okay <laughs> yes my dogs my husband who's quite quiet he's a computer programmer and he likes playing his computer games <laughs> and then, so he's uh, no he fun yeah so he's no fun <laughs> well he is but when we do our outdoor activities fun but and um and then agility yes there's a lot of chatting all day long about agility and then of course ne teaching and needlework is really great because you get to talk to people who love needlework and yes. enjoy learning. And I really enjoy passing on my knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Getting people to get better in the technique. Not just doing the technique for the fun of it, but getting better in it. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are In making these videos, has mm -hmm. that been uh, a learning experience? Obviously, the, the process of making a video, but also in, in terms of teaching the techniques, has that made you do things, pay more attention, do things in more detail? Um, I think, no, I think I do the same detail in the class. Okay. So right. what happens in the, in the class, what I do is a demonstration to the student on how to stitch it down, and I explain to them at that point what not to do, in that, and I'll be doing that in the video. So it will be the same thing that you get in the class. It's just you can get more, uh, it's over a longer time, so you get more feedback. But, of course, when I'm doing the videos, I really have to make sure I cover everything. Yes. So I have to yeah think as I go and then of course there's going to be as it's live as I'm stitching I don't want to have to do this 10 times so there's going to be a little stumble here and there right, right <laughs> where right. I might muddle my words so people are just going to have to accept that but it yeah. will still be really really good <laughs> yeah no I just wonder because yeah. oftentimes if you try to offer the same information with a new technique or a new approach mm, then yeah. you know the light will go on wait a minute I haven't been explaining this as well as it could be uh or I've been leaving this yeah. out all along. How can I do that? Yeah. 
yeah, that can happen. And that can happen when you're teaching as well. And then mm-hmm. the student will ask a question and go, oh, that's a really good point. I, yes, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I might want to <laughs> put that in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or in the instructions, right? Or, and, and yeah, that's right. Next time I demonstrate that to the next group, I will me- never to mention that. So you, you also learn a lot when you're teaching in a classroom situation from your students because yep. if they're struggling with something, then you think, oh, yeah, now I really, we have to cover this in a slightly different way or explain it a bit better. Yep. So that, you know, because if one person's struggling with it, no doubt several other people are, but not saying anything, right? Exactly. So a lot of people, yep. yeah, a lot of people keep their mouth shut because they don't want to sound stupid and it, uh, it doesn't matter. I rather people ask a question and we get them so everybody knows what they're doing rather than somebody going off, going back to stitch, but not really knowing what they're doing. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that's. I mean, I'm a former science teacher, and and uh, I know I know that. Yeah, you get you go to teach any subject, and, and it'll it'll make you get your act together in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, if you want to keep on teaching and have people have you back, yes, yep. you better get your act together. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll never. The first time in in uh, freshman biology, I was doing a segment on spiders, and it was a, a farm community school, and. I was I did not thoroughly prepare myself and I started getting an education about spiders from the kids who lived on farms and oh, wow. uh, yeah that, that first day I went home that night and I got my I got my act together in a hurry cuz <laughs> oh. yeah no that's uh, I I always remember that so, yep yeah, you want to want to teach something or you want to learn something teach it yeah you'll learn it <laughs> yes that's yeah. true yeah that's another thing is like you might be stitching for a long time and think, well, I'm not that good enough to teach. But I bet if you told, um, spoke to a beginner who had never done that technique and actually went through teaching them, you would learn a lot more yourself because you would really start to understand the technique yourself more by explaining it to somebody right. else. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah and and yeah. Those, those questions that come back and, oh, how can I, yeah, I, yeah. How can I leave <laughs> that out? Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, that's a bit embarrassing there when children like show you up, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that was a tough day. I'll tell you, that was a tough day. Yeah, because um, yeah. yeah, I got I got a couple lessons out of kids for on spiders because you know they deal with them all the time on the farm and uh, <laughs> they knew where, what were poisonous and what bites you wanted to avoid and yeah, they knew all that stuff and it's like, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh well. Yeah. So, w- how did you get started with needlepoint? It, is it the standard learn from mom and grandma that uh, got you going, or not needlepoint, but needlework in general? Uh, yeah. uh, well, um, my mom, she's a she's a needlework teacher, so oh. she did the city. Yeah, she did the city and gills course when in England. In fact, my mom came, was from Holland, and she came to England as an au pair, and she met my father in a pub, and. Um, uh, and the, the good old fashioned did... bar meeting, yeah. huh? <laughs> <laughs> right? The good old fashioned. It's the smallest pub in England in Salisbury. That's where <laughs> they met. And so, so she stayed, and she got they got married, and then she did the city and guilds course with the Embroiderers Guild, and then um, so taught her um, adult education and needlework. So she's done that for ever, like since she's about twenty eight years old. Oh, yeah, and she does more like day classes rather than weekend ones. So her work is uh, really, So she's really still good. teaching then, huh? Oh, yeah. She's like 76 and she still teaches. Oh, that's great. Wow. Yes, yes. Because <laughs> she enjoys the actual um, one-on-one teaching, uh, you know, the group teaching as well. So that she's built friends through that, so she continues doing it. And she's very versatile. She does every single technique as well, but ba- m- not as like in depth as I do, but she covers every technique and – also, she makes boxes. She does construction stuff. So it's just not not just pictures. It's just all over the gamut. Oh. So when I when I was a kid, that's fantastic do... that she's still doing that. That's just great. I know. Yeah. I know, isn't it? Yeah, she still does weekend classes for the embroidered girls in England. Yeah, oh. she's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so she would like me get me to do little projects, little um, crafty projects, and needlework as well. And then I do have the benefit that my granddad on my father's side my yeah, my dad's father he he was an artist all his life mm. um, a romantic artist who's very colorful and into wildlife as well uh, that's me and so i have the artistic background for my granddad for designing and then the uh, the technique of stitching from my mum. so you were just immersed in it as a kid then 
Yeah, not that I saw my granddad very often because he wasn't very social. We see him <laughs> twice a year. <laughs> he lived seven miles away and we saw him twice a year. Oh, my. <laughs> But, he's, he's an artist. Um, he's entitled. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can be a bit reclusive artists. Yes. <laughs> uh, and so, but he was there, art in the house, obviously, from his, his work. And my mm -hmm. mom's needlework around me all the time. So, and I just had a passion for it. Uh, in contrast, my sister had no artistic desire whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Get me out of here. I'm sick of this. Oh, absolutely. She sewed for her finger with the sewing machine. It was not a good, you know, so she was just not very <laughs> you know, handy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that that's great then. So then you got you got art right from as soon as you were aware of the world then. That's great. Yes. Yeah, and I would like, when I was young, so say 16 or before I went to art college, I would be like, um, walking around in the countryside sketching or taking photographs my sister would be off with her friends in the town i would be out in the countryside right mm. so i i would that's where my interest laid i was really artistic well i i wouldn't say i was a really good artist but i just enjoyed doing the drawing and yeah. then needlework with mum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah well it, you know yeah. the good the good can come with with the with experience and trying oh, things. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Practice always makes you better. Yeah. So, yeah. so then, then you're, and then you, you run into the uh, Royal school then. Yeah. So then when I um, finished school, I, at school I did art and it was more fine art based and English. And then I, um, after school, I did a one year foundation course in art and design. So then you try all different types of art, and then you can specialize at the end of the year. And I specialize in textiles. Okay, well, so, back up. Back, help me understand that. So a foundation course just gives you the kind of the waterfront and then to, to expose you to different things. Yes, that's right. So we did uh, fine art. We did pottery, um, textiles, uh, printing. So a whole wide range of different things. Oh, so we okay. tried a bit of everything. And then because I know I was good at needlework, because I'm really good, and like I was a perfectionist, mm -hmm. and I was good at fine art, I, I specialized at textiles at the end of the year. But the particular art college that I went to was really a modern art college. It was you know, geared towards, you know, um, slapping it together, burning it, painting it, and it all free for modern art. And I'm not very good at that. I'm not that kind of brain. Mm -hmm. I enjoy um, more fine art, realistic. Mm -hmm. So... I didn't want to go to any of the um, degree courses, like goldsmiths. A lot of people were going to goldsmiths to do the fine art uh, textiles there. And I didn't want to do that because it wasn't really me. So I thought, well, I know I'll go and do restoration instead because I knew I could be perfectionist in that. So I contacted the Victoria and Albert Museum. And they said, yes. I love that. Do. I love that. Give me the stuff where I can be a perfectionist. Excellent. <laughs> And so they, I asked them about the restoration course and they said, yeah, we have a restoration course, but you have to have a degree in science for the cleaning. Mm -hmm. And I didn't ha have a science background at all. Um, and but they, t they told me about the Royal School of Needlework that had the three year apprenticeship course. Oh. And so uh, so I contacted the Royal School of Needlework and they had me there. I had two interviews, one with um, the principal at the time, Elizabeth Elvin. And then um, another interview with the teachers, and then I was accepted onto the course. And then I, that was from 1990 until 93. And then I stayed another two years working in the workroom. Oh. So I was completely so was that, immersed. Was that interview Sorry. intimidating? Um, a little bit nerve wracking. I had a feeling they didn't really like me. Oh. <laughs> and I really, I, like, because I always come from art college, and I think they kind of liked people coming straight from school. Where they're a bit younger, a bit more moldable. Oh, <laughs> um, I've, yeah, I've, I, I've heard that. Somebody else mentioned that yeah. that they don't like you coming in with a lot of uh, habits they have to break. Yeah. Yes, but I I did have good technique, so I just showed them stitching samples. Anyway, but I was dressed like an art student. <laughs> you know, really not not nice and neat and pretty and all that. <laughs> You know, <laughs> oops. <laughs> well, that's okay. They they did accept me on the course, and I think it was either the first or second year I got the highest score in the year. Oh. And on my re on my report, it said a surprising result. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> I thought, what the hell? I worked really hard. <laughs> 
Ouch. <laughs> but, you know, appearances can be deceptive. Because I, I was like, I'd like to have a lot of fun. Like, outside of the Royal School of Needlework, I, I joined the university uh, uh, diving group and the caving group. So I was adventurous too, right? So I always wanted to have fun outside of just doing needlework. And I think they thought maybe I was a little wayward or so. So they didn't expect me to be so dedicated, I think, to the actual <laughs> needlework. <laughs> well, I, can, I can just hear the teacher meetings right now after after a day. <laughs> oh, that Tanya, I don't know. I just don't know I about know. her. <laughs> and I was a little bit outspoken sometimes as well, And whereas a lot of other people might be a bit quieter about things. And, <laughs> and But, I mean, I, like, I, I just speak my mind sometimes, and it can upset people. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> oh well <laughs> oh yeah i can hear it in the faculty room right now yep. mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. but say now i thoroughly enjoyed my five years there um, the techniques i learned were fantastic the teaching was fantastic um the teacher i had at the time deborah she was such a perfectionist as well in stitching more than me and i learned so much about technique from her and i just enjoyed the whole immersion of him stitching there it was wonderful and so much so that i would go home and stitch every night for two or three hours after for homework and that's why i did well during the coursework mm -hmm. and at weekends i would put in at least five hours a day at the weekends so you you were and really so, you were really dug in then yeah i i mean i mean i did it because i loved it but yeah. some people weren't as dug in as me, but I really, really loved it. Mm. So, yeah. And so you were there five years? Yeah, so for the first three years were the apprenticeship. And at that time, the apprenticeship, you spent, uh, I think it was two months upstairs working on your own design, and then two months in the workroom because they wanted to make their money back for, like, your tuition, right? Uh -huh. So you would work in the workroom <laughs> on the on the worst jobs right <laughs> of course yeah <laughs> yes of course but that's okay you have to start somewhere right? right and then two months in the workroom and two months in your own work two months in the workroom that, and the first two years were set up like that and then the third year you spent the entire year in the workroom making money for them and, uh -huh. and but you know it worked well because at that time as it was an apprenticeship course you were um, paid minimum wage or below and because of it the government gave you housing benefits oh. so I never ever got in debt when I was at the Royal School of Needlework. And now, and now it's a degree course. And I think it, with the degree course, you probably have to pay for that. And I'm mm -hmm. not sure if you can get grants or anything. So I can't imagine. So, so you, were getting, you were getting the best education and actually getting paid for it then? Yes. Yeah. Oh, and actually, never, I mean, I wasn't making that money, but I was never getting into debt. Right. And that's different from a university course where you pay for an education and then you're in debt at the end of it. Can right. you imagine being in debt on a needlework degree? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> then what would you like? It would take years to make your money back. I mean, more than a doctor. Oh, my God. I can't imagine being in debt coming out of a needlework degree. It'd be awful. Yeah. Because it's such a hard um, living anyway. Right. And <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But, oh, well, God, it was just like, it was, it was work, but it was fun work. But yeah. we did have two mature students in my year. And mature students at that time, they were in their 40s. So they were married and they had children. And both students did not make it to the end of the three years. They, I think they both dropped out in the second year. Oh. Because the workload was too much. Mm -hmm. So you work all day from nine to five doing your stitching. And then when you get home, you are got to put in two or three hours homework if you want to like get good grades. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they would come home and their husband would expect dinner. Right. right. Because that's it's the old school way then. And and then you're tired. And do you really feel like sitting and doing two or three hours of work? Like my dinner would be a snack. I mean, I don't really care about dinner. I would just, I don't know, <laughs> make something really easy and quick. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I could do my laundry whenever. Whenever, whenever there's a pile up big enough. <laughs> not have to worry about, <laughs> about the rest of the family. Yeah, yeah. So... What is it? What it's is it? Do, do the laundry today or go naked tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, the Royal School of Needlework would not approve of that. No, I'm sure not. <laughs> I'm sure not. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's too bad. Yeah, that's so, too bad that you know if you have a family and you really want to do it that you know yeah. but yeah there's just a limit to what you can do in a day yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if you go into a course like that, you already have to keep that in mind. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I think in the year that I was in, there was eight people 
and we ended up with uh, now I know it's nine people. We end up with only four of us in the end because the two mature students dropped out. There was a deaf girl in the group, and which I I think would have been fine, but she just couldn't obviously follow um, uh, you know visual in, um, instructions, yeah. and her quality work wasn't good enough. Mm. Yeah. And then we had another girl in my group, and she was too much of a perfectionist. We would just go crazy with her because she would, for every three stitches you put in, two stitches would come out. So oh my. her pro, yeah, her progress was so slow. I mean, it was the most perfect work ever, but it would be if you were that slow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and they had to let her go because you know we you can't have someone that slow working in the workroom because you're not going to make your money back, right? Right. Right. And it comes down to, in the long run, you have to make a living out of this. And the same for the Royal School Needlework. They have to hire people who can stitch fast enough to make a living. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what kind of work did you do in the workroom? So when, in the first couple of years, it was um, very uh, uninteresting things for me. Um, like there was a lot of old samplers that came in that we would just conserve, really. We would darn it and we put a piece of um, silk net over we put it back onto an acid-free board and it go back into the frame. There were a lot of tapestries with holes in them. So we would re um, reweave the hole and put oh. in the stitching back. Oh, God, it was oh. so tedious. And for me, it was tedious. <laughs> I'm, bo I'm bored just hearing about it. That's just, oh, jeez. <laughs> and this is why I'm so glad that I never ended up in conservation. Because if if I had gone into the Victorian Abbey Museum and gone into one of their courses, a lot of it is repairing tapestries or just netting them. Uh -huh. And... I, do, I have to have something which will just make me think a bit more, um, be a bit more creative. <laughs> <laughs> but there was one lady at the Royal School Leaderwork, and she loved working on the tapestries, just repairing them, and she was a bit older. And I said to her, oh, why do you enjoy this? And she says, you know, Tanya, I've done all the stuff that you've done before, the creative stuff, like she's been doing it for years. Now I just want to sit, enjoy stitching, and listen to my radio books. No. So she was quite happy just to sit and stitch and just enjoy listening to her radio. But for me, I wanted stuff where I could design or challenging needlework. Yeah. And the uh, tapestries weren't doing it for me, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then you get a lot of just one um, weird one-off things that customers would send in, like cushions which needed oh. repairing, like family heirlooms. Oh. A lot of those would come in, yeah. Mm. And then... Uh, we also had some interesting projects like um, well, um, hangings, like banners for certain companies. Oh, okay. And a lot of um, uh, church vestments and altar frontals as well. I think I worked on four of those during the time I was there. And they take a long time. They take six months sometimes to do the vestments and, um, and the altar frontals. But that's got to be challenging work, I would think. Yeah. I mean, one, one particular altar frontal I worked on was uh, <clears throat> it was a boat. Um, I can't remember what the theme was now, but it was a uh, the wooden part of the boat, and it was kid leather, and you had to sew down this kid leather. Oh, my. And, yeah, so the first day, I was just using my fingers and a needle. Uh, uh, two, two days later, my fingers were perforated trying to sew for this <laughs> leather. So then I was using pliers and a thimble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that'll yeah. make you scramble for the thimble in a hurry, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I don't need a thimble. Yes, I do need a thimble. That hurts. <laughs> I'm bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't get me the blood on the work, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Gee. Yeah. So then you, you go through that, and then the last two years, then are you teaching? Um, so, yes. In the last year, we became assistant teachers. And so we were helping other uh, teachers teach so they could learn how to teach, right? But I don't think – I didn't I didn't do that much teaching there. It wasn't until I left the Royal School Needlework. I did a bit for embroideries guilds. But not until I got to Canada did I really start immersing myself into teaching. And that's where I learned a lot about teaching as well mm -hmm. because – I, at the time at the Royal School Needlework, there wasn't a specific teaching course. I think they have something more set up now. I'm not sure you'd have to check with them. But at the time when I was doing it, you were just learning with the other teacher who was teaching. Oh. So you just watched them and be an assistant. So, yeah. um, and then you, um, if it's a good teacher, you 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 know you learn some good stuff. Yeah. But uh, yeah, hmm. but I mean, I've I've, done, I've taught a lot now, and in the first year in Canada. Um, where I first started teaching at the Purple Needle, they were so, so nice. 
And um, I learned a lot from the students there about improving my, my t teaching technique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it'll yeah. do that. It'll do that to you. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So then, yeah. then what makes you leave the the royal school then? Right. So believe it or not, I got totally saturated of stitching, like completely over the top of stitching for five years. I thought, ah, oh, it's time for a break. <laughs> like so like I, I don't, don't want to pick up a needle for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, I just I was getting bored, and I get bored easy. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I had a boyfriend at the time for the um, the diving club in the university, and we had decided we we're going to go to Malaysia because his dad was t um, living in Malaysia. He was working out there, uh, but we broke up. So I thought, well, you know what? I have the guidebook now. I'm going to go to Malaysia anyway on my own. So. I spent a few months reading up in the guidebook about Malaysia and Thailand because I decided I'd go to both those places. And then I thought, one of the other girls at the Royal School of Needlework has spent um, eight months in Hong Kong. And um, so I thought, well, you know, afterwards I can go to Hong Kong and work because then I then I can even come home or we'll see what happens after that. So I, um, I left the Royal School of Needlework after the five years, and then I landed in Malaysia. And I, lo I love that. I love that. I'm in the <laughs> Southern Hemisphere. I might as well keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so well, I get to Malaysia, and I, I, the, ta the, the taxi driver takes me to Chinatown. So I said, uh, the backpackers is in China Chinatown. And um, and he goes, you sure you want to get out here? I said, yeah, this is where the backpackers is. <laughs> he goes, you sure? I said, well, yeah. He says, uh, I said, where is it? He goes, oh, I think it's up that road. He didn't even want to drive me up the road to the backpackers. Oh <laughs> I know. So I got out with my backpack. And I thought, oh, all right, I'm going to head up the road and just hope for the best. And I saw a, a Caucasian guy. So I thought, oh, maybe he speaks English. <laughs> <laughs> so I, said, I asked him where the, if he knew where the backpackers was. And he said, oh, yeah, I, I've stayed there when I first came here. And it's a good one. And so that's where I went. I went to the backpackers and then started traveling. Um, at that time, it was really good because you meet other travelers. who, You know, there's a lot of single women traveling, more than men. And... Mm and more than couples as well so i met other single travelers in the backpackers and we would travel together but on the whole i would be on my own more than traveling with a group because i would like to spend two or three or four days in a place where most people would want to spend one day in a place and then move on oh. whereas i like to spend a few days in a place get myself immersed and really you know see the environment and then move on so i would I was more of a loner in that sense, but you're never alone because in those backpackers, you meet lots of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 There's yeah. And so I traveled from Malaysia, Thailand, and then I went to Hong Kong and I spent eight months there working in the bar. My intention was to be there three months and work in the bar and get enough money, but <laughs> Hong Kong just soaks your money away by drinking <laughs> because Oops. there's nothing else to do. Yeah, I know. There's nothing else to do in Hong Kong. <laughs> so you, you go to the bar with your friends and then, yeah, the money you say gets eaten up real quick. And I mean, not heavy drinking, but just socializing, right? Right, right. And so after eight months, then I went to the Philippines for a month. And then I went to Australia. And about five months into Australia, I was at a backpackers and I was working. I was doing picking tomatoes. And I met a guy from Canada, which is my husband, Russ. And so we spent another month or so or two there at that backpackers, getting to know each other. And then we decided to travel on together. So we bought a tent and we hitchhiked across Australia um, and backpacking. Would you across not the know continent? It? Uh, yeah, across Australia. Wow. And like got dropped off in the middle of the bush. And then um, people like, I mean, I think we're pretty brave now when I look back at it. <laughs> yeah. If there'd been a bushfire or something, we might have been. <laughs> Or also the backpack murderers have been, there's been several backpack murderers in between the times that we've been there. Oh. So yeah, they pick up backpackers and kill them. But yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we were lucky, but we saw lots of Australia. And so I was spending yeah, a year and a day in Australia. And then we flew out of Victoria, I believe. And we went to New Zealand and we stayed with my friend, Joe Dixie. Joe Dixie was in the year below me at, um, at the Royal School of Needlework. She also does needlework now wow. but her own stuff mm -hmm. and then we toured us we bought a minivan um, a camper van in our, um, new zealand and we toured there for four, four months and then we left we went to um to the usa and then we traveled up the uh, west coast of the usa back to canada and then we got into canada yeah oh. and 
Russ had always said to me, oh, yeah, um, Calgary is close to the mountains. So I was picturing the city in the in the mountains. Yeah. <laughs> but Calgary's in the prairies and it's yeah. about an hour. And we arrived <laughs> in a February where everything is completely brown. There's no green whatsoever. Calgary itself is fairly flat and it's only uh, 130 years old about. And so there was no um, history to it all at all and some very ugly areas and um and i thought oh god where's he brought me to <laughs> <laughs> i was so disappointed it wasn't in the mountains <laughs> and it it took me probably eight years and before i and i really love calgary before i really started feeling at home and i think another reason it took so long was because I was so concentrating on needlework in my own house without actually going out and doing stuff as much as I used to do. Like I used to oh. do the caving and diving. Mm -hmm. And so one time I was in the USA and they had this uh, guy doing the jambe drumming at one of the events at the needlework events. And I thought, I know I'm going to do that when I go back to Canada. So I did a class in the jambe drumming, the African drumming. And I met a friend through that and so then I started the social life and that's when I started feeling at home in Calgary because mm -hmm. then I started having friends, oh, friends outside of needlework. So I was going to the embroiderers guild every month, but I was like 28, 30 years old and everyone else is in their what, 50s and 60s. Right. right. So there was no one, no one of my age group there. So yeah. when I started doing the drumming, there were people of my age group, which is, you know, just so you can relate a bit more. Sure. And, and then once we got our own house, we got the Newfoundland and, and then the old English sheepdogs. And from the that with the agility, uh, I have a social life too. So now, you know, it would be hard for me to move from here now. <laughs> now, while you were traveling the world, <laughs> did, did the stitching just sit on a shelf? I mean, or did, were you doing some yeah. needlework? It sat on the shelf. I was in um, Australia and I wanted to make a little bit of money. And I, I went to the needlework store there and I said, uh, um, I can do commissions if anyone wants one. And a woman had commissioned me to do some geisha, like uh, Japanese, a couple of ladies to, to demonstrate the thread. Mm -hmm. And so I stitched that for her. <clears throat> and she was really happy with it. Um, and probably have it a little surprise because <laughs> cause <laughs> I did have my photograph album with me of what I can do. But, you know, when you commission someone and you don't actually see the embroidered pieces, it's probably a little bit risky. But right. she was really, really, yeah, she was really pleased. But it really was on the back shelf. My interests weren't really there. It wasn't, I wasn't settled enough in one place. And I, I wasn't uh, that much of an addict that I wanted to continue as I was doing it. I kind of drift in and out of things. So, mm. but when I got back to the Calgary, it settled in Calgary, then I got fully immersed in it back into needlework again and mm -hmm. it comes back really quickly so i had a firm a, a free two and a half year break from stitching but so you just like, right. you just really you just needed that break from yes the school then yeah well really because if you're stitching in you know, um um like six to seven hours a day plus extra in the evening for five years that's a lot of stitching you can just it just yeah. can get a bit too much right yeah. you can get yeah. ja you get jaded mm -hmm. right yeah yeah it just gets a bit too much well, for me, and for me, I like variety, so, and yeah. that's why I have a lot of different things going on in my life right now, not just <laughs> stitching. <laughs> yeah, you don't sit still very very well, from what I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people say I don't know how you have the patience for the stitching because <laughs> I want to do active things like yeah. the agility and yeah. you know. So you get so you get to Calgary and then so the the, the stitching comes back and and yeah uh, so when I when I got to Calgary I thought well, what the hell am I gonna do it's <laughs> like I, the only qualifications I have is needlework oh or maybe work, working in a bar in Hong Kong and that, that's not kind of the I don't really want to do bar life and, you know it's the environment there's everybody was smoking at that point so yeah. so I thought well I, at the time Calgary had five needlework stores. That's how popular needlework was five? at that time. Yes, five. So wow. there were 600,000 600, people at that time, five needlework stores. There's a million, 400 or 300,000 here now. And there is only, there's no needlework stores in Calgary itself. There's two on the outskirts of Calgary. <laughs> how times yeah. change, yeah. Yes, well, it was lucky for me, hey, that they were here when I came here. Right. So, 
So the, the first place I went to was the Purple Needle, and it was a really great environment in there, very social, busy, people come in and stitch, and yeah, it was lovely. And Shelly there, I showed her some of the pieces I embroidered, and I said, would you like me to, because um, when I got to Calgary, I actually stitched up some examples of needle painting, because I didn't have any of my embroideries with me. One of them was a dog that I gave to Russ's mum, of her dog, and then a couple other animals. So I said to uh, uh, Shelley, would you like me to teach this technique? She said, oh, yes, please, because they hadn't seen this technique in Calgary. So, and she said, well, you'll probably have to come up with a small, you know, uh, easier design. I think the first class I did w with them was animal portraits. Mm. But then I realized with teaching that, it was just a bit too, too involved, you know, too uh, advanced for beginners. Yeah, yeah. So then I came up with the Wild Rose. And, mm. and, and that was my... And I, and when I designed that, I thought, well, let me design this with the elements of people that people can learn from it. Satin stitch and long and short stitch, right? French knots. So I actually was more thoughtful about designing for teaching. Mm -hmm. And and um, one of the ladies in one of my classes, the very first class with the animals, she got so frustrated when she was trying to stitch the piece. And she <laughs> was like in tears. Oh, she my. said, it would be, yeah. And, and I, I didn't realize. And she said, um, would be so much easier if you um, can stitch some direction lines in. Because when we do needle painting, we draw the angle of the stitches that we want on the actual embroidery. Right. Uh, and she said, well, it would be easier if there were stitched in directions. And I said to her, that's a very good idea. So what we do now is we stitch in some guidelines along the actual piece, not, wow. not really close together, but mm -hmm. for the angle that we need in the color that we need, and then just fill in between. And then it's easy to keep your angle. Because if you have just a drawn pencil line on the embroidery, your eye forgets it's there. Mm -hmm. But if you have a stitch in there to follow, then your eye easier fills into that stitch. Yeah. So I learned from her that <laughs> that would be a good method. So listen to your students, right? Yeah. Did, did you save yeah. her as a student? I mean, did she? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's some dedication to, to be in tears and then... Yeah, you know, yeah, she 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 still carried on with it. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, that was a while ago. That was like uh, nineteen years ago now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that yeah. sounds a long time. Yeah, yeah, no, she continued she she continued stitching, but I felt really bad for her. But once we we got past that, yeah, she she carried on. Yeah, okay, <laughs> good. Yeah, yeah. Good. I've only had one other person cry in my class, and that's in uh, nineteen years of teaching, and she was upset because. When I do my demonstrations, what I do is I break up the class into, say, four or five groups, and I demonstrate the, each, the same technique to each group. Mm -hmm. And then they go back and stitch on it, and then I bring the groups up again. Now, if, if there's a faster group of stitchers, I'll have them out first, so they're not sitting and doing nothing, right? right. Because I, otherwise they'll get bored, and I don't want anyone sitting and doing nothing. So that means that some, some, some of the slower stitchers, as in slow speed of stitching, not, not in mine, but they're just slower in speed, they might be in the last group. Well, mm -hmm. she got upset, but she didn't tell me this because she thought she was behind because she was in the last group. No one's behind when they're in the last group. It's just their speed might be just a bit slower, so I will do them last. But usually on the next day, what I do is I start with the slower group uh, because we're doing something new, and then, then we'll go that way. So I just have to be aware that people are not going to get upset because they think they're behind because <laughs> no one's behind. Everyone gets to learn what they need to do, but... right. Right. You no, know, not everyone's going to be the same speed. Yeah. It's not possible. <laughs> oh, the <laughs> dynamics, the dynamics of classrooms. Yeah. 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 yeah I want everyone to be happy, right? right. That's not oh, yeah. fun if someone's upset. Yeah. 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 Oh, I yeah. remember those days. That's okay. <laughs> but now, now if we look at, if we look at your website and all of the kits techniques you have, mm -hmm. I mean, there's black work. There's, I don't know how many kinds of white work. Gold work, counted, cross stitch, counted canvas, cross stitch, needle painting, a uh, couple kinds of lace. Do these all come from your years at the Royal School, or are they things that you've just picked up through the years and added to your your uh, repertoire? The only one that hasn't come, the only couple of things that haven't come from the Royal School is Carrick Macross lace. And carrot macross lace is very similar to fine white work, which the Royal School Needlework teaches. And the reason I started doing the carrot macross lace is when, um, oh, God, when was I'm having a mental blank now, and this is what I 
<laughs> the, the royal wedding. What well, got married? No. Oh. So, you know, um, she was wearing. Um, I'm not very good at that. I'm not. I don't, oh, God, I don't follow yeah. those things. I, I know. I'm English. I don't. <laughs> William and what's her name? Uh. <laughs> People are gonna kill me. <laughs> Kate. When she oh, okay. got married, she got married. Her dress was inspired by Caramel Cross lace. So I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. I want to have a look at that. So I purchased a kit from Ireland on how to do the technique. So I wanted to, uh, to understand the technique compared to fine white work, which is very similar. And then I did um, a sampler instructions on how to do the actual technique. And that was really fun to do. The other one that I um, that wasn't taught at the Royal School of New York is the hapsack lace, which is just canvas work stitches. And I just do that because I find it really easy to do, right? Mm -hmm. So if I, if I want to design something easy, I'll design that. And I can take it on the road with me and just stitch it on the road. And it's just one color. And so I don't have to worry about it. Um, whereas I don't take my needle painting and gold work um, with me on the road to stitch because it, it requires too much concentration for me and the right lighting and stuff. Yeah. 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 So, so you're, so you're, and it seems from your designs that you're able to just bounce from technique to technique without any any trouble. So you've obviously studied and used all of them rather extensively then. Yes. The Royal School of Leader, I can get a lot of practice in the techniques. But there are some techniques I don't, I haven't continued with, like hard anger, most of the white work ones, except for the fine white work ones. Um, so I think, personally, if you are really practicing a one of the technical techniques like needle painting or black work is quite then it's easier then to transit um, transition to another technique because your hand is already practiced and your brain is already practiced as well to visually see mm -hmm. um the stitching right it's not so easy to go from cross stitch say to other designs because cross stitch is quite easy it's just a basic stitch right right but if you're doing needle pointing and you're doing all the different canvas work stitches and then you want to do transitions and say to a surface embroidery, it's going to be easier for someone to do that than it would be for somebody who has had no experience because your bre your hand is already practicing the technique of mm -hmm. stitching. Yeah. So, okay. So that's cause see, I'm a firm believer that, that uh, needlework is one of those arts hobbies crafts I, I don't like calling it a craft i don't i guess much more than a craft but one of those uh areas where those techniques a technique in one area transfers and really helps you move to another one with less resistance with less mm -hmm. a, a l little lower learning curve and i think that's one of the great things is you is you you really can transfer those skills with just some modification and experience completely different worlds Yes, I agree with you totally. I do. And it's just, I know people get stuck on the thing that, oh, I'm a counted worker, but not a surface embroiderer. But I'm both. I mm -hmm. enjoy all techniques. I and mean, I've been lucky because I've been, I've, taught, I've been taught in all techniques, right? So, and I think it's good to bridge out because I think it, it's better for your brain to learn new things than to be stagnant and stay in the same technique all the time. I really yeah. think it's better. And if you are intimidated about doing something like needle painting and you're, and you're a counted worker, the best thing would be to do is try and take a class because this, then the teacher will try and get you over that barrier, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, whether that be in class in person or an online class. Um, if you don't try, you're never going to get better. And, and I've learned this from agility. Agility is one of the hardest things to do <laughs> because you're not only having to train yourself to handle correctly, but you're working with a dog who can do what he wants, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you've got, you've got a team partner there who can be quite erratic. Now, take Monty, for example. If I don't tell him exactly what I want, he'll decide what I want. And he'll go, well, she didn't tell me, so I'll just go into that tunnel there. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> that tunnel, yeah, that tunnel looks like fun, so I'll just run off in that direction. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> you've got to be so specific, so you have to, you know, and the same with needlework. If you don't try and try different techniques, how are you ever going to improve your stitching skills? I mean, you, fine, you may not want to. You may want to just come home from work and do something easy. Or you might be more like me who wants to experiment and try different things and just feel like that you're growing in something, growing, mm -hmm. you know, you're not just staying in one spot, but you're growing.
Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you never know. You you might find something you really like better than right. what you're doing right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. People who say, oh, I've lost my enthusiasm. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's kind of my automatic response. Then go try a different technique. Yeah. Just yeah. just take a whack at it. You, yeah. Because exactly. You might find you really like it a lot more. Uh, if nothing else, it'll just make you think differently. And yeah. uh, and then, yeah, if you don't like it, what are you out? You know, so what? That's it. Exactly. And it's a relatively cheap hobby, uh, depending. So yeah. My, yeah. My, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, well yeah. So my, my actual kits are very inexpensive for a lot of instructions, for a lot of hours of work mm -hmm. that you get out of it. For an innovating kit, it costs you like... I know, $58, which is less than American, is like $45 or $30. And you get probably, I don't know, months of um, stitching out of it, right? right? So that's a really cheap hobby compared yes. to you can go and have a massage and pay $75 for a massage, you know, and that lasts you for one hour. Right. right. <laughs> and you have nothing to show for it. Right. Yeah, by, by the next day, you're all tense again. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No, so that's think, the, you know, that... That argument, that perspective on needlework is if you do, if you take it to for your for the, your cash outlay, how many hours of enjoyment? Yeah, it gets to be real cheap in a hurry. Yeah, that's it. And it's then it's like stuff you can do in yourself at home. You don't have to go out, you know, yep. if it's cold and wet or snowy. You don't have to worry about going out. Yeah. Yep. So. Oh, yeah, that's just it. And, and, I, and you have something to show for it at the end. Yep. That's exactly it. Because yep. you can sit in front, you might be tired after a day of work and you sit in front of the TV, but you have nothing to show for it at the end. Or if you go for a, go to a movie, you don't have anything to show for it at the end, right? Yeah. With needlework, you, and you've actually practiced your brain and improved your skills, mm -hmm. which is, will be good for your brain in the long run. So. Well, that's just, a good, that's just a good marketing campaign right there. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, Sorry, everybody. You're not trying to sell my stuff. No, no. I, no, I mean, you know, that. I mean, just in, for, in general, for the hobby in yeah. general. I mean, it really is. Yeah. There's yes. just an awful lot of pluses to it. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, um, I think any hobby that you do with your hands uh, and your brain is good for you. Mm -hmm. I think it just keeps you going longer. Yeah. That's what my mom says. That's that's another reason my mom says she carries on teaching. She says, I think if I stop. I think my brain would go downhill pretty quick after that, you mm -hmm. know, so it keeps her mind active. And the same with my father. He still teaches. He teaches philosophy, and he does that twice a week still, and he's 78. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Keep, yeah. The, keep the wheel spinning. Yep. That's it, yep. exactly. All yeah. right, we're going to have to wrap up here, but I got to know about I, um, uh, these long-distance hiking. So the West, was it the West Coast Trail? Yeah, West Coast Trail, tell, yeah. Tell me about what it's like to hike a distance so that, like that. Oh, horrible. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we did that when we first came to Canada, so probably 2002 or three, I can't remember now. And so you take all your food with you on your back and your tent and your cooking supplies. And we went for 10 days. Most people do over six days, but I know my stamina for hiking eight hours in a day is not going to happen. I won't be able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so we went for like, we hiked for four to six hours a day. Mm -hmm. And then the first day was brutal because it was literally vertical climbing uh, oh. um, up and up and down, rutty, uh, rooty, wet and over logs in the forest, right? In the rainforest mm. um, on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, my legs hurt after the first day like so bad. And it doesn't get any better. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the last day is the best because it's flat. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it, it was really lovely. And I, I'm kind of glad we spent the extra time because we would get to, um, to the camping areas earlier so we could um, find a nice spot and just relax a bit. People were coming in at 8 o'clock at night and then they'd be out again at, like, 7 o'clock in the morning. Ooh. Where we would, yeah, we would start later. Well, we start about 9 and we get in about three or four and and um we saw some uh whales out in the sea and hummingbirds and stuff like that it, but it's fairly popular trail so the only thing is you don't you're not really secluded out there there are other people hiking it as well so if you want to be on your own the west coast trail is not the place to go 
Okay, because I, won- I wondered that if, if you were just completely isolated for long periods of time, but yeah. not at all. Huh? No, yeah, no, yeah. no, there's loads of people hiking that. Now, we did a canoe trip in Wells Gray Park. Now, that was isolated. Oh. That one was where you um, do a loop of lakes, and then you portage between the lakes. Mm. And we pretty much, well, most of the time we were out on our own. We saw a few other canoers when we were out there. And it's in grizzly bear country. And the first night that we camped... Um, but I woke up and I looked over. My husband was going, shh, bear. And oh, he no. looked like, he, he was lying there and he looked really, really frightened. <laughs> and I took my earplugs out and I could hear him breathing as he was circling the tent. Oh, my. Uh, I know. And then, you know what I did? I put my earplugs back in. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to hear it. Just like an ostrich. Can't see you. You're not there. You're good. <laughs> exactly. So he went off and tried the bear bins and then it left. And um, and so that first night we had the bear spray in the tent, and then after that I, we kept the axe in the tent instead because I were thinking if we let that bear spray off in the tent, we would have just gotten plastered ourselves, right? Right. With the with the axe, you may have had more chance, but anyway. So when we got back to the um, camping, like to the main area, we reported back in, and we said, "Oh yeah, bear circled the, t- the tent." She said, the, "The the gamekeeper, whoever it is, the warden said, did um." Did you see what type of bear it was? And we said, no, no, we are not going to open the tent to see, hello, what type of bear are you? (laughs) That was a funny question. Oh, my. Nope, nope, didn't leave a calling card, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I just thought it was the funniest question. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, no. No. We were were just trying to not be noticed. Thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, jeez. Yeah. So it was an adventure. That was a really cool trip. Um, uh, glass-like lakes in the middle of grizzly bear country, mountains. Oh, it's wonderful. Oh. Really wonderful. But unfortunately, we haven't been able to do trips like that because now we have the dogs, right? Yeah. And that means putting the dogs into kennels. And, and we just have, we, we go through phases. Um, we just haven't been motivated, to tell yeah. the truth. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. takes some motivation to do a trip like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Oh. But def- definitely worth it. Oh yeah, yeah. I gotta believe it is. Yeah, memories, memories that most people never get close to. Yeah. Well, exactly. Like I like to create memories and doing things like this. So let's hope I keep my mind so I can remember these things. Well, you will. <laughs> <laughs> you will. All right, Tanya. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for taking the time. Really, really yeah. fun. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> All right. Thanks to everybody for listening.